Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Molly Ackland, and I'm the Content and Communications Manager here at MorePay. It's my pleasure to introduce the topic for you for this session, which is making your workplace worth the commute. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we move on to the webinar this afternoon. Um, so the agenda for this afternoon, Michelle will start off by taking you through the pros and cons of remote working. She'll then discuss what's truly important to your employees. Michelle will then cover a section on enforcing office attendance and what the regulations are surrounding it. She'll go on to talking specifically about Gen Z and will finally cover how to make your workplace worth the commute. We'll then move into the Q&A section where you'll have an opportunity to ask Michelle some questions at the end. So if you're wondering how to ask a question, um, after the main presentation, we'll move into the Q&A section of the webinar. So you may have noticed that your microphone is on mute, but we do want to hear from you. So please do drop your questions into the question panel shown here. We've had a really incredible response to this webinar. And um, so I imagine we'll have lots of questions at the end, but Michelle will do her very best to get through as many as she can at the end of the session. And on another note, if you are facing any technical difficulties, please don't worry too much. Um, we'll be sending everyone a recording after the webinar. Um, however, if you are facing any technical difficulties, please do flag it in the question panel, because if lots of them come flooding in, then I'll know that there's an issue on, all, on our end and I'll do my best to fix it. So before I hand over to Michelle, um, I'm conscious that we ha will have a few people on the webinar that aren't familiar with more pay. So I'll give a very brief introduction. So we provide payroll and HR software, as well as outsourcing services to UK businesses. We've been around since 1966, have all the accreditations you'd expect, and we're rated excellent on Trustpilot. Our promise is to make payroll and HR easy, and here's how we do it. So we've built in payroll and HR software that's easy. We deliver quality outsourcing options. And all of this means worry-free compliance for businesses. On the slide here, you can see some of the businesses who trust us to take care of their payroll and HR. So that's enough about us. Let's meet today's presenter. So I'll just start by introducing you to Michelle, who you may recognise if you've attended some of our webinars in the past. Michelle is our HR Services Director and has been with MorePay since 2017. She is C CIPD qualified with 20 years of both operational and strategic HR experience. So Michelle is responsible for running all of our HR services um, activities here within MorePay. Good afternoon, Michelle. I'll now hand over to yourself and we can get started with today's webinar. Thank you very much, Molly, and thank you to everyone for joining this afternoon. So just as a bit of an introduction then, um, this topic on um, making the workplace worth the commute or remote versus office work in general, it, it really is looping round at the moment to what is the right um, way to go. I think if you look back to pre-COVID, although remote working was a thing, it probably wasn't as common um, as it is now. And then during the pandemic, a lot of us didn't have a choice. Um, we had to work from home and we had to make it work both as employees and businesses. But we're a couple of years on from that. So what does that mean now? What is the best option? And then for all of you on the call today, how do you make the right decision for your business, for your employees and for your customers? I think if you imagined that you gave 100 employees in your organisation the choice to be in the workplace or work from home, do you know what they would say? Are you aware of how they feel about remote versus office working? Do you truly understand what their wants and needs are? Um, we are starting though to see a trend of employers wanting people back in the office and thinking about the benefits that that may bring, that times are changing. We've really come out of that work from home COVID era or for the reason of COVID. So what does it mean um, for your business now? 
But whether your company is hybrid in the office full time or fully remote working and looking to make some kind of change, the well-being of your people is really important in this. And one of the things that we're going to talk a lot about here is how it will impact your employees as well as your business. As with everything, there are pros and cons um, to remote working and, and versus home working. And I just want to dive into this a little bit more. There is absolutely benefits of remote working and these can't be denied. I think we unexpectedly saw a lot of them during COVID and, it's, and I'm keen to keep some of those things that we really built up and some of the changes and some of the boundaries that we broke down. And I don't think in this webinar we're going to be able to get to the argument of absolutely defining which is right and which is wrong, but want to give you a balanced view of pros and cons, things to consider. But with this, we're going to try and focus on if you decide a full return to the office or a partial return to the office is what your business wants to do, then what do you need to think about and how can you make that work? So thinking about the benefits then of remote working, um, there's going to be quite a lot of information on these slides to come. So I will sort of go through these um, in a bit more of a, not as much detail, just because I'm conscious that I want to get through the slides and I want to get to the questions. But um, as with all our webinars, you can watch them back and you will see the slides later so you can go into it in a bit more detail. But looking at the benefits for remote working, it can be a powerful tool for both employers and the employees. One of the things that you will get is a great candidate pool because you're actually accessing talent from a wide pool across various locations in, in the country. Um, the traditional way of recruiting was to look at a certain area that was around your office, look at the, the commute that that person was having, would it be viable, and then really limit your pool. There is a much bigger pool out there if you're looking at remote working, and that may give you a chance to attract some higher level talent without having to think about relocating them. Um, and it does support diverse hiring practices. I think there is less commuting time um, for a lot of people and that can be built into their work days. It saves them significant travel time and it can generally have a positive impact on their wellbeing and work-life balance. Not forgetting the improvements to environmental impacts around things like lower CO2 emissions. It can also help employees save money on things like travel expenses just for themselves. It can just decrease the need for large office spaces for employers, they'd save money in that way. And it could be something that is attractive to shareholders and investors. Um, overall, there is a feeling that it is better for work-life balance. It gives employees control over their work hours and breaks. It can help with flexible hours for personal commitments and just really improve engagement overall um, in employees, which as it says there in the middle box, can lead to higher productivity and motivation and it is found that remote employees can be much more product productive and efficient in what they're doing. There's also benefits around potential staff um, turnover being reduced, that employees feel more loyal, that they feel the work settings more enjoyable um, and this leads to lower rates. And then uh, not forgetting a really important benefit around diversity, it really does support equality, diversity and inclusivity initiatives. It can be an ideal situation for people who themselves have disabilities or are primary caregivers, whether that's people looking after children um, or looking after elderly relatives. It can really give them that sense of flexibility. And again, you are opening the pool that you are accessible to. Um, and it can really help with reducing gender uh, based biases in traditional settings. As with everything, though, there are pitfalls and downsides and um, what you've seen on the screen now you might be thinking what on earth are they showing us here um, and although this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek I think it, it gives quite an important message so we've said you know it's been four years since the start of lockdown and since we were all given the um, the message to go home and stay at home and stay safe um, but down the line now is it the golden delusion that it might have appeared to be at the beginning? And the thing here is talking about physical health concerns. And this is a study which is examining the future of the workplace. And re researchers from Furniture at Work created um, what can only be described as a shocking 3D model of the absolute extreme of what future remote workers could look at, uh, could look like in an absolute worst case scenario. And they've named um, this character um, Anna. 
Um, and the idea here is that um, if we do continue with remote working, we need to look at how we make this uh, the best solution for our employees and for us as human beings because continued remote working can lead to physical changes because the constant use of laptops, smartphones, smart devices, poor posture, the potential for reg uh, regular movement to be lacking and it can, um, we all talked about this a lot during COVID, but it can lead to a more unhealthy diet and you will see Anna here um, she, poor Anna, has red and swollen eyes, um, a bit of a hunchback from leaning forward, her hands are clawed and she has swollen limbs um, from, from sitting down for so long. So as I said, a little bit tongue in cheek with, with what we've shown here, but I just think it's important to, to, to think about these things and think about actually what does that mean? These are all things that we need to consider, maybe not in this extremity of Anna, but things we do need to consider. So continuing then to look at the pitfalls of remote working in a bit more detail, one of the areas to consider is around social isolation. So you do miss out on office and in-person interactions, which can make it a little bit more difficult to build those strong relationships. I know we've really moved into quite a digitized, digitalized world now, but there is something to be said about those um, personal and face-to-face -face interactions that help with um, relationships and people being socially part of the work environment that they're in. And sometimes disconnected employees might feel that they're experiencing negative um, mental health issues. It is often said that remote workers can work longer hours. So while they may be more productive and maybe more efficient, you need to make sure that this isn't going to the extreme because sometimes remote workers feel that they need to work um, more hours to prove their worth. And there becomes, this is the biggest part for me, a real blurry line between work and personal life. And it can almost feel like you're constantly on call. Whereas in the office, there is a moment where you have to turn off your laptop, shut down, get in the car, get on the train, walk home, cycle, however you get home, there's a real definitive end point. There isn't that um of remote working i know i've done it to myself um when i'm working from home i might nip out to go to a pilates class or something and leave my laptop on and continue when i get home there isn't quite that definitive line um and that can be a challenge uh, to disconnect uh work from your home life and that can have long-term impacts there can be an increased strain on teams where there isn't face-to-face -face communication and people management recently reported that in, in the recent years, there's actually been a 44% increase in bullying claims and in employee tribunals in the UK. Now, it is difficult to know that this is purely related to remote working without going into the level of detail below, but it's a stat that is um, quite interesting and something worth bearing in mind. One of the other things is around onboarding and training challenges. Um, according to research by Glassdoor, um, a successful onboarding program can really improve employee retention by up to 82 percent and then productivity of that person by over 70 percent so a strong onboarding um, and training program for somebody starting is absolutely crucial but the truth is and i'm sure you've all had to do this at some point whether it was because of covid and you had no choice but remote onboarding does require extra care, extra words, extra resource to make sure that that person feels welcomed into the team and that they've got that same personal touch. Um, and it's, it's useful bearing that in mind. And then kind of looping around to the, the whole idea again um, at being kind of always on call culture, it is this feeling around digital presenteeism. So there's a, a bit of a pressure around people to feel that because they've got their laptop or their phone and they're working from home, that they are there to answer calls all day. And Canada Life Research um, found that 46% of remote workers do feel pressure to be more present, um, even outside of working hours. Um, continuing then, with remote working um, and looking specifically at mental health and the positive and negative impacts, so we've kind of covered overall benefits, overall pitfalls, but I just would like to take a moment to think about mental health. There are positive impacts that come from remote working, and I think we've all seen these as well and probably experienced them ourselves. But this is around healthier routines in some instances where you can dedicate more time to self-care. So when you're finishing for a lunch break, you might have the option to take the dog for a walk um, or fit in a, a half an hour gym class or something like that, something that's a lot more accessible when you're working from home. 
there are ways that it can help improve time management and help people be more efficient and quite a lot of people and I know I've had people in my team who say this that they appreciate the quieter work environment without having the noise of other um, team members around them but again there's a flip side to it and it can have negative impacts and there are studies now we're starting to get into a certain amount of time that people have been remote working that there can be a rise in mental health conditions that are caused by home working if it's not managed correctly there are reports that suggest people feel stressed under video meetings and i remember right at the beginning of covid this was one of the things that are a bit of a debate over whether you should force people to turn their cameras on or not and um, some people really didn't feel comfortable putting their cameras on they felt um, quite vulnerable they didn't necessarily want people to see their home environment in the background um, and it, it can in, in invoke stress um, if we just assume that it's all going to be all right and then there's a big thing around poor posture um, and the potential impact of that affecting brain function and we will come on in a short while to talk a bit more about the health and safety implications of remote working so then i think it's important to look going forward um, if you're thinking of changing things um, at what uh, from the point of view of understanding and meeting your employees needs as well as looking at your business needs and it is really important to look at it from their perspective um, if you're returning to the office um, and you're looking at introducing a policy whether that's full-time or hybrid there are things that you need to consider before you do this. There are some things that are legalities, which I'll come on to in a second, but there are some sort of softer areas around that I think it's really important to consider. And you'll see here in the survey that, that we've mentioned, um, the Resume Builder survey, 90% of companies who were surveyed said there was some plan to implement a certain return to office policy by the end of 2024. And within that survey, almost 30% of employers said that they could or would threaten to dismiss non-compliant employees now it's quite a complex area of law um, and i will give you the highlights shortly but before i do that i just want to talk about considering what is the best way to handle this if you are starting to look at this and really there are three areas when you're considering what your employees want and balancing that with what the business needs um, and what is best for the business the first area is about listening to um, your employees. You can organize one-to-one -one meetings with them to understand the real deep truth about how they feel about working at home versus working in the office. What are their fears? What are their hopes? Hybrid working is obviously something that can be considered as a, as a mixed solution. And the other thing that you could look at doing is conducting surveys. So things like an EMPS survey um, or a small kind of pulse survey to really get a temperature check of how um, your employees are feeling about their work environment and what they would like to see change and if there was change coming the things that would help them with that change the second thing to consider then is around characterizing or understanding really what they have said to you so understanding the roles and motivations of your employees thinking about the different groups of people that are represented in your organization and how do you try and consider as many of them as possible when making the decision of, of what to do and how to do it. And taking all this data to help um, design the right employee experience um, to do this, which will enhance retention and satisfaction. And then the last area that you really need to look at is just making sure that there's an element of empathy in there. It really is about putting yourself in the shoes of your employees and understanding what their roles are like, what their experience is like, both in work and out of work, and how that how that can translate into the best kind of work environment, things like mapping out their journeys, but then also from a policy and procedure perspective, make sure that you review those policies and procedures, look at any outdated ones, um, and really focus on helping employees perform at their best. Now, you're never gonna get one solution that fits all, and you are gonna end up having to come up with a solution that kind of meets in the middle, and there'll be some people who'll be happy about it, and some that won't be happy about it. But the more work that you have done up front when doing this in terms of listening and characterizing and empathizing, the easier it is gonna to be to get buy-in from the employees. 
So on to the tricky question then, which is around enforcing office attendance. And this is a question that we've had quite a lot on the advice line um, when businesses and our customers that we work with are wanting to move back to either full office working or some office working or increase the amount of office work they're doing. Can I reasonably dismiss an employee for the workplace? For, for, ref, sorry, apologies for refusing to return to workplace. Um, there isn't a one um, kind of silver bullet answer to this where you can say a black and white yes or no because it is always dependent on circumstances and I will caveat everything I'm about to say now with you must always seek some kind of H HR or legal advice before you do this so it can make sure that we get um, the right details about that case so if you are a, um, a more pay HR services customer we would always say to bring the advice line and get one of the advice to talk you through it but I'll try and unpick it as much as I can and the first thing is to look at some practical steps to consider um, the biggest thing is around health and safety risk assessments now this was particularly true when we were returning from COVID because that I would say and this is my personal opinion that the biggest concern that is was that the workplace was safe to return to from a COVID perspective. There is still um, a big, um, there's still a big focus on health and safety. So I think that should still be consideration even if the risk of it has reduced. But you have to give employees comfort that their workplace is safe to return to um, whatever the circumstances. It's often recommended to kind of phase return to work. So you don't just go straight from an extreme of five days at home to five days in the office, gradually introduce employees returning to the workplace starting with one or two days a week and help them build up to it. You might be able to think about staggering work times and offering a bit of flexibility there to avoid for people to avoid peak travel time or you might have employees who want to do a school drop off or a nursery drop off. Think around how you can make that um, a bit more attractive. Um, and again, I'll come back to the word empathy. Um, now it can be difficult and I'm in that situation where, you know, whether you're HR on this call, whether you're a business owner, whether you're a manager in your business, you are all trying to run a business and do a day job. Um, and I've had managers say to me in the past, it's really difficult. I want to be sympathetic. I want to show empathy to everyone, but I don't have quite have the time to do it. It's still important to think about it and consider it. You don't have to sit for hours with every employee going through their whole life story, but just showing that you've cared, that you've listened, that will really help going forward. And then when concerns are raised, I think that's more the thing is being proactive to allow them to raise concerns, and um, then it will really help you going forward. I think overall the answer is yes, you can require an employee to return to work. Um, but employees can refuse if they believe they have a reason and it's really how you deal with that going forward. And to kind of go on to that, I want to look a little bit more about the legal perspective. So the first thing you're going to have to do is um, look at the terms and conditions. How was the work environment agreed in your contracts originally, whether that predates COVID, it was during COVID or after? What was set up as their place of work in the original contracts? When you did decide to work from home, if this was because of COVID, was it agreed as a temporary measure? Um, was it for a specific length of time? What, what did you do in terms of those changes? And as part of that, did you redraft any contracts with the intention of it becoming a permanent arrangement? Now with everything, you might have thought at one point, yes, we are gonna permanently move to working from home, but now things have changed and we need to make a choice. Um, I think the two things I would call out though is if you have it as a temporary arrangement, it is in general easier for you to make a reasonable request with notice on an employee coming back into the office. But you do, again, need to tread carefully and make sure you're doing it in the right way. But generally speaking, it would be easier. If there's a permanent agreement around remote or home working, then these changes are going to need to be made with the terms and conditions. And I'll talk a little bit more about how you can do this. Um, but again, it is something that you would need to seek advice on. The other caveat that I would probably put in there is that even if you had temporary arrangements in place and these were during COVID, we are at the point where it is four years later and you must be aware of the fact that it could have become and it could be argued that it has become custom and practice for remote working. Um, it could have become an implied term in your contract. So again, this is why it's really important to, to sort of tread carefully. 
So if you were looking at changing terms and conditions, again, seek legal advice, well, you've got to uh, obtain the employee's express agreement to the changing terms and conditions, whether this is individually or through a collective agreement, and you really need to try and get written confirmation from the employee that they accept these new terms. Um, it might be advisable to give some kind of consideration to an additional payment or benefit as compensation for such um, a big change. Um, if an employee refuses to return though, you need to understand from them and have in writing that they are refusing to do this or if they are coming into work that they are working under protest because if they don't make their protest or disagreement clear, you could technically agree that they have implied by actually accepting the change. Um, and then in answer to the question, can I dismiss the employee as a result? As a last re resort, you can technically or potentially terminate an employee's current contract and then offer them re-employment under the new terms and conditions. But ACAS advised that this should only be considered after all other attempts to reach an agreement through some kind of consultation have been exhausted. And I think it's really important to look at the next slide, which is around a case study. And um, this is quite a famous case that has happened um, not so long ago, uh, follows versus nationwide. And this was all around um, refusal to return to the workplace um, and kind of is the caveat to everything I've said before and the reason that uh, you definitely need to seek legal advice. But in, in this instance, um, it was found that dismissal for refusal to return to the workplace was actually found to be unfair. Um, Ms. Follows actually was found that she had been um, discriminated on the grounds of sex and disability in an indirect way. Now the employee was caring for her disabled mother and remote working meant that this was possible if she came into the office she was saying she could not meet the needs of her mother for whom she was the primary carer um and on the this nationwide and dismissed her it actually resulted in nearly three hundred and fifty thousand pounds being compensated to the employer for this indirect dis disability discrimination so this is around uh disability discrimination by association and the, the main findings in this case were that it was found that Nationwide had not made the decision based on any factual evidence. They had subjective impressions and conclusions that they had jumped to without finding out the detail. And another big thing is that they failed to consider and then document all the alternatives that could have been and should have been looked at. Um, so it's quite a big case, this, in terms of case law for us going forward, and obviously something that we build into our advice when we are giving advice on this now, of all the things that you could and should look at whilst you are doing this. Um, but if, if you've got any spare time, you want to Google that case, it's, it's really quite an interesting read. And um, just before we move on, though, I'm going to hand back to Molly, because we are just going to conduct a quick poll. Thank you, Michelle. Um, yeah, we are um, just going to take a quick break from the slides and give Michelle a little bit of a, a rest for a minute as well. Uh, so we just thought that we'd include a little poll in this webinar. Um, so if you could all take a minute to scan the QR code that you can see on the screen there in front of you. Um, and so scan the QR code and uh, a, little, a little short poll will come up um, and if you could just take a minute to answer a few questions about your current work environment, um, we'd really appreciate it. Um, I'll give everyone a couple of minutes to do this now before we move into the Q&A session. Thank you.
Okay, thank you for taking the time to um, complete that poll. Um, be really interested to see the results of that. So the last couple of sections then, um, I just want to really think about um, what you can do then to help encourage employees to return to the office, kind of putting the legalities to one side, because you're going to have a really diverse range of employees in your business with different needs, different priorities. And as I said, it's going to be really hard to please everyone. But what we've done here is taken sort of Gen Z as an example um, and what you could do to specifically look at this generation. Now, they are actually met, met, set to make up 30% uh, of the workforce by 2030. So this is kind of people who were born sort of late 90s, turn of the millennium up to about 2010, 2011, those early times. So by by 2030, there will be a large proportion of them in the workplace. Um, and that we have found that they often view the traditional office sets, which I would probably describe as what you would have seen pre-COVID, um, as the word mid. Now, I had no idea what the word mid. I am not very, very up with things like this, but apparently this is slang for mediocre. Um, so taking this, this generation example, you know, what are the sorts of things that you need to understand and think about when you're looking at attracting that talent for going forward. Now, in understanding them, there are 57% that said they would still prefer in-person jobs, which is really promising that it's over half and that they do want to be in the office. 80% said they would quit due to a toxic work culture, um, which is a really high percentage. I mean, obviously, this is good if they are standing up for what they believe in and not wanting to work in toxic work cultures and making a shift away from what may have happened and may have been accepted in years gone by. Um, but 75% said better well-being um, and focuses on that will really support and boost their productivity and efficiency in the workplace. So the sort of things that you can do when attracting this kind of talent, one of the first things is investing in technology. So even if you do want them in the office, there's still a real need for advanced tools, um, and digital ways um, of working with them. And this starts right at the recruitment stage. Think about how you engage with them during the recruitment process, um, the onboarding process, and um, how can you digitalize that and use software to the best of your advantage um, to attract people who have grown up with this kind of, this kind of technology. It is all about fostering um, an environment of diversity and inclusion. It is really valued by this generation. Um, and it's thinking about your leadership team, the processes that you've got in place, um, how can you make those more, more diverse and inclusive. Um, even if you are thinking about working from an office, it doesn't have to go back to that traditional nine to five. Think about what flexible working arrangements that you could offer. Is that some kind of hybrid working model? Is it more flexible working hours? Um, is, is there some policies and procedures that you can put in that makes it easy for people to take time off for appointments um, or where they are um, caregivers? How, how can you build in flexibility and not just think, if I go back to that office, it has to be back to that five days a week, nine till five, um, the very, what it says at the top, the traditional office setup. There are lots of different ways to do this. Thinking around promotion and development, how is that clear in your recruitment, onboarding and development processes, where there's opportunities for growth um, for those individuals um, and other individuals in your organisation, and then a real focus on voting wellbeing, whatever those initiatives are. Um, we'll, we've covered these in, in, in different um, webinars, so if you ever wanted to look at our library, you would see the information there. And then finally, sort of trying to answer that question then of how do you make it worth the commute for all, not just focusing on one um, particular generation. There's just a few sort of top tips on here, which in the interest of time, I will rattle through. Um, and again, you can kind of look at the detail. But um, as it says there, getting your employees back into the office doesn't have to be grueling work. And these are just some tips and things that you can look at. Try and make it a collaborative in process when you are bringing employees back into the workplace. Involve those um, that it is going to impact. Think about the legal obligations that you'll need to, to review and be open and honest with the teams around what you are doing and how you are doing it. And do bear in mind that there is new legislation on carers leaving flexible working um, that 
is protective of people in those situations. Create a culture of convenience um, for the teams that you have. You might want to introduce incentives that, and initiatives that really help lighten personal burdens and make people understand that, um, or make people see that you understand that their outside um, outside life really um, is important to you. Um, and an example here is there are places where they introduce free dinners that you can take home um, so that you don't have to cook for your family that evening. You know, it's a, an extreme one potentially, but just some ideas that are out there. Um, think about could you organise events, whether that's regular events um, or coincide with national awareness days and weeks with things like mental health awareness. And it really helps celebrate team success and bring them all together. What other incentives that are light, friendly incentives that you could offer that can make it more attractive? Subsidies for lunch, money off vouchers. Um, do you have a discount portal that you can offer that will help them whilst they're in work and they're going to the shops on the way home? Um, is there any ways that you can donate to local charities um, because of the way that people are um, in work together? Always make sure that you have reviewed workplace health and safety policies, making sure that first and foremost you've got a safe working environment for everyone. Everyone knows that and everyone feels that. Make sure that you've got the right things with um, fire safety. Also look at um, promoting and having mental health first aid as we have those in more pay and I think it has been an amazing initiative to have in the workplace um, and a really strong commitment by the business to, to the folks on it. Again, just think about technology and the technology that you use in the office and how you connect with people even while you're sort of sat next to each other. What systems are they using? How easy is it for them to use it? Um, and really make sure that you've invested in the right technology. Um, covered it already, but do just keep thinking about flexible working options. How can you make it more attractive to be in the workplace and make that commute worthwhile? Um, while still allowing people to feel that they have some balance um, from the work and home life. I think during COVID, one of the big positives for me was that there was a real boundary breakdown of work and home life. I think even in the way that people spoke to each other about their work and home life um, and, you know, a, a real shift and that you sort of saw the person behind um, the employee in the office. And I think there's still a lot to be, to be gained from that. I think, you know, being in a world where somebody could quite openly say, look, I have to go home um, at this time to pick up my child from nursery or I have to go home because I'm responsible for my elderly relative and I'm the only one who can be there to make their tea in the evening or whatever it is. You know, allowing people to feel that they can say that um, and it not impacts how people see them at work. I think taking some of those small things um, is a real thing to, to think about. And then it's about, could you reinvent your office space? What office space have you got? How does it look? How does it work? How does it feel? Does it create the right environment? Um, I'm not necessarily talking about beanbags on the floor, like in that picture there. Whatever works for you. Um, but again, just don't think that if you are moving back to the office, it has to go back to that traditional place. There are loads more ideas of, of how you could make it worthwhile, um, but it was just really a snapshot of some things that you might like to consider. So just then in summary, before we go on to the Q&A, because I'm sure we've had quite a few questions that have come in, um, I just kind of want to leave you on this last slide, which is the key takeaways. Um, I think really weighing the benefits of remote working um, against it pitfalls is really important. As I said at the beginning, there isn't an, a final answer to this argument that one is better than the other. It may be a balance of both. That might not work for your organisation. You've got to decide what's right for you, your employees and your customers. Um, understand the impact um, that remote working may have on employees' mental health, whether that's positive or negative, and a return to the office, how will that change and how will you manage that change? You really need to understand the employees' needs through listening, um, characterising their roles and then empathising with their experiences and this really needs to be talked about and balanced with the needs of the business. Adapt to the expectations of the upcoming generations and in this instance it is, it is Gen Z that are, um, that are kind of fast up and coming and very soon will make up a large portion of the workforce. Not everything needs to be geared towards them because hopefully we'll still have a really diverse breadth across your organisation, but think about what's up upcoming and how you can adapt to them. And then think of those practical tips to make the workplace more appealing 
um, and worth that commute and um, there are there are lots of ideas from there but in the interest of time I'm going to stop talking and hand back to Molly so we can go through some of the questions Brilliant. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was really interesting. Thank you. Um, now, so we'll move into the Q&A session. Um, please do pop your questions in the Q&A panel now um, and we'll pick them up and work through them. Um, so we do have one question already, um, Michelle. We'll start with this one. So how can a remote working environment deal with health and safety matters especially when related to display screen equipment. Um, how can companies expect to be responsible for health and safety and make the workplace more attractive? Okay, so if you had full remote working, then there needs to be an understanding that you still need to comply with health and safety law. There was a little bit of a, um, a more relaxed approach to it during COVID because it was seen as temporary, but if you've got permanent remote working in place, then you do need to look at those health and safety laws um, and which apply to you. So this is things like carrying out uh, risk assessments, DSE assessment on their equipment. And a lot of the time this would be through the company themselves, making sure that they provide them with the right equipment, whether that's desk, monitor, keyboard, mouse, chair. Um, there is still an onus on employee employers to do this, even if people are working from home. Um, as always, I would really suggest that you'd seek health and safety advice on how to do this properly. But if you are moving towards a hybrid um, model, um, there's a little bit of a different focus. So um, there's still some expectations that you need to make sure that it is a suitable environment, although there is limited things you may be able to do at their house. But if they are in the office the majority of the time, then that is your main place of work for them. Um, and there's a, a little bit of a difference. And um, it's a really good question. And we've helped quite a few companies with their policies on this. Um, and I really would recommend getting some more information to help do this properly. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have a question here. Um, so since um, this workplace in particular, since that the, the um, employees have come back, obviously since COVID, um, they've kind of been asking their staff to come in and their employees seem to have an expectation that it's the company's responsibility to actually pay for um, for the travel um, and before Covid they you know obviously wouldn't have really thought about that before they'd pay for it themselves yeah. what how can how can they kind of go go around this are, are there any trends that um, that we've been seeing that employees um, may want to seek some kind of benefit for, yeah, for travel. Yeah, I, I think this is it. Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, and it's these kind of practical issues that usually cause the most um, time and resource being taken trying to resolve them around employees not feeling happy. If before COVID, now obviously I don't know the, the exact details, but if before COVID there was five days a week in the office um, for this particular company and then they moved to working from home, as a temporary measure um, and expect their employees now to come back to the office for whatever reason you really need to look at the contracts if the contracts state that they are home based then there may be um, it may be a reasonable request that they are compensated but if their contracts still state that they are office workers with some kind of hybrid um, or a more of a temporary or casual arrangements working from home then you should not have to compensate them for coming back into the office. Um, we would need to know more details about how that was set up. Um, but I would say if there hasn't been a change in the contract, then it is just as it was before that they weren't asking for compensation to come in the office and you could do it like that. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Michelle. Okay. Um, another question here, one from Natalia. Um, what is the biggest difference between offering employees hybrid working and a flexible working option? Um, hybrid working is the term that has um, sort of been coined and stuck around now to um, say that you work part in the office and part at home. Um, but this is some kind of flexible working arrangement. So I would say that flexible working could be many things. This could be reduced hours. It could be 
reduced days, but doing the same hours so you condense in your hours. Um, it could be flexible that you don't have to start at a particular time um, and it's more that you come in when you're ready and work a certain number of hours. Flexible working covers a massive range of options and is usually quite individual to that person. So when flexible working requests are put in, they are usually very um, dependent on that individual circumstances. Hybrid working is the phrase around sometime working in the office and sometime working at home. So I would say that it's a form of flexible working. That's perfect, spot on, thank you. Um, okay. So how should we communicate policy changes to our employees um, to ensure legal compliance? Um, if we are moving to a policy change which isn't impacting terms and conditions, the main thing is to communicate up front, to be open and honest and make sure that you engage with all your employees, allow them to raise concerns. If you are making some kind of change to a terms and conditions, this is where you need to do it in a much more formal way um, because the employee will need to agree to those terms and conditions and they need to be a reasonable change. Um, you know, case in point about follows versus nationwide, um, one size doesn't fit all um, and that's where you need to take some really specific advice about individual circumstances. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Um, got one here. Um, okay, so after moving to hybrid working, when required to be in the office, some employees say that it's their work from home day and they refuse to come to the office. So the policy that this, this employer has in place is for 60% of the office, um, sorry, to be in the office 60% of mm -hmm. the time and 40% um, of the time to be at home but with flexibility. So their question is, how can this be made more clear to employees that when expected, they must be flexible? Yeah, I think it sounds like the policy has got that covered because that was going to be my question. When you, you put the policy in place, have you said it will only be these days? Um, it's usually advisable in a lot of circumstances not to be that specific because business needs change. Um, this again is a difficult one, but the um, first standpoint should always be to talk to the individual to find out to understand the reason why and not to make assumptions so if somebody is saying that's not my normal working day in the office um i'm not coming in ask them why they're not coming in because there may be something behind it and it may be something related to you know a caregiver or um something that maybe is not obvious um again not to harp on but back to that case do not make assumptions on their behalf so i would always suggest a softer approach at the beginning of understanding why, reiterating to them that the business expects some flexibility um, and being honest and open about why you need them in the office that day. If there is a continued refusal, then that would be something that you would need to speak to an HR professional about, about and then figure out what kind of process to take them down. Now, on the face of it, that could be misconduct failure to um, comply with a reasonable management request but it is never that straightforward so you'd certainly need to go through those individual circumstances before deciding what the appropriate process to follow is. That's great advice thank you Michelle. Um, another question here is uh, so what suggestions do you have to encourage staff back into the office? Um, I mean there's lots of suggestions um, and I think really um, pick out any ones that you want from, from what we've talked about of suggestions of how to get people back in with the tips. My personal opinion is that the um, engagement up front about why you are doing this and listening and empathising and understanding about people's circumstances will really, really help. That is probably my top tip. Um, you know, throwing things like pizzas on a Friday or putting a, a pool table in the kitchen, those things alone won't make um, it more attractive, but it may help. But the biggest thing is to get the buy-in and understand how your employees feel about this um, and sell the reasons as to why. We, we had it ourselves here that people obviously felt nervous about coming back to the workplace. And the, you know, the other thing is sometimes it does just take time. Okay, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. 
Um, so if anyone out there has any more questions for Michelle, please do pop them into the chat. Um, okay, we have one here from Lockie. Um, what advice do you have for a company that has a three to five day hybrid split in the office, um, but not enough space? Um, so they're struggling to get people excited to come back and understand that you know the space is is an issue is an issue um sorry so their modeling for the hybrid return showed that if people spread their office days over the week then it wouldn't be an issue but most people who do come in come in say tuesday to thursday um with monday and friday being very quiet yeah they're obviously working from home um what advice do you have in terms yeah, of Yeah, that? that's a difficult one. I can understand most people feel like they would like certain blocks of time in the office and that it makes sense that over a weekend, um, I have a of a weekend that it's working from home. I think the first considered being some kind of incentives um, for people who return on those days. Um, I think that would probably be the best way to start. I would um, set up some polls and surveys to see who would like to work what day and make sure that you've got a real idea of who wants to work on what day. First of all, to assess that you do actually have a problem. And if the polls tell you the same, that what you think is true is true, then think about how you can incentivize people to come into the office on those days. Um, and you know there, there are lots of options if that fails and you are still trying to make it work then I would seek some advice on how you do this in a fair basis and the only other thing that you might want to think about is some kind of rotation so on some days some weeks they work you know on Monday Tuesday Wednesday in the office and the next one it's Wednesday Thursday Friday and think about some rotation so everyone gets the benefit rather than it being set days but again just speak to them speak to a HR person to make sure that you're doing it in the fairest way possible yeah, that's some really some really great advice there. Thank you. Um, we will just go with one more question before we close for today. Um, so, are there any legal implications of allowing some employees to work remotely while requiring others to return to the office? There can be. Um, hypothetically, though, there may be individual circumstances that mean that somebody has a flexible working request that has meant they work from home and that's been granted. And in some ways that's always been the case that you have to listen to an individual's flexible working request. Um, that really hasn't changed. So there may be an instance where two people doing the same job, one's at home and one's in the office, but for very different reasons. Um, and that is um, something that you can legally do. Um, I guess then the other thing to look at is the types of jobs. There may be certain jobs in your organisation that require you to absolutely have them in the office for whatever reason that is, but there are other jobs that make it less um, of an issue. Again, that would be something that you could legally do. The difficulty that you've got is, you know, even putting the legalities to one side is how you manage the engagement of the team and the expectations and people's just actual genuine feelings of, it's not fair that can sometimes be the trickier part of it it's the softer skills but with all of these just being as, as open and as honest as you possibly can be um you know with certain caveats and and being upfront with your employees will really help that amazing thank you okay um so before we wrap up today we've just got a few little bits to go through um, so first of all, um, I'd just like to point you all in the direction of our Knowledge Centre. Um, our Knowledge Centre is really easy to find in the menu on our website. Now it's packed with lots of really helpful resources, including upcoming webinars, guides and blogs, plus everything on there is free to download. Um, so I'd really welcome you to go and have a look because um, there's lots of great resources in there for you. And finally, if you would like to find out more about our HR and employment law services, please just drop us a message into the Q&A um, and one of my colleagues will contact you. Our HR advice line runs 24-7, 365 days a year. So no matter when an HR issue crops up, best practice employment law advice is always available over the phone anytime, delivered by our highly experienced team of qualified experts. 
So before we finish, you will see a little prompt to fill in a poll when we close the webinar. So here we're just looking for some opinions and insights to help us tailor research, resources and content for our listeners and readers. So if you have got a few seconds at the end to complete that poll, then we would really appreciate it. So that's everything from us today. Everyone who has attended today uh, will receive a recording of the webinar and a copy of the slides as always. Thank you so much, very much, Michelle, for hosting today. You've been absolutely fantastic. And thank you to everyone who joined. I really hope that you found this webinar useful um, and hope that you have a lovely rest of the afternoon. I will now close the webinar. Thank you so much.